Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that uh, introduction. Um, I'd like to uh, firstly thank Ikria uh, for enabling me to be here at this uh, gathering. Uh, I've never been at an Ikria event before, so this is a debut occasion for me, and I'm very grateful for that. And I'm, of course, uh, grateful to you, Sanjay, as well for <coughs> facilitating that. Uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Pulipaka has mentioned, uh, oh, I must say also that I'm delighted to see um, my very good friend, Mr. H.K. Singh here. It's a long time since uh, we were on the same t side of the table, uh, but um, it's a pleasure to be reunited with you in that way. Uh, as uh, Mr. Pulipaka has said, uh, the Asia-Pacific uh, is uh, really like Asia or emerging Asia or South Asia, a very fungible expression, and it's not easy to define. In the 1980s, this uh, term was associated with the membership of APEC, but after the Obama visit this year, uh, it apparently includes uh, India as well, at least uh, in the American strategic thinking. Nothing over the past few decades has changed the global economy like the rise of China, which with the industrialization and modernization of certain other parts of Asia has led to a most remarkable transformation in the past 30 years and is the reason for the reorientation of the global economy uh, towards the Asia-Pacific region. From being recipients of manufacturers to exporters of a competitive variety of goods and services, emerging Asia has impacted global financial markets, production networks, and pricing of commodities, apart from having an increasing bearing on global political strategies. Small regions like Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau enjoy developed country living standards and high economic growth rates. And uh, GDP is a reference point uh, to influential world capitals. Apart from Japan, four Asian countries are in the top 16 in the World Bank's GDP table for 2014, China, uh, India, South Korea, and Indonesia, uh, and are climbing. Besides this, there are many other positive Asian trends to be discerned, political, institutional, technological, and educational among them. Indian, Chinese, and South Korean cultures, including um, pop culture, have gone global and added immensely to soft power perceptions. If these trends in basic indicators continue, the Asia-Pacific's political and economic influence in regional and world affairs will increase. But the Asian rise harbors risks that can undermine the transformative process. Asia needs technology and specialized skills to climb the value-added chain and avoid the middle-income trap. The unsettled relationship between rising and established powers and between the rising powers themselves may hasten or delay the advent of an Asian century. Although dire predictions of the implosion of China and the descent of India into dystopia have proved wrong, and there is growing optimism among the Asian capitals. Let me confine myself, like uh, as I can see all the other speakers at this conference, uh, to the Asian and not the American segment in the Asia-Pacific formulation. It remains an open question whether the Asian rise will lead to emerging Asia, constituting a new group of world powers, though clearly China is well on the way to that status already, with the Belt and Road, the AIIB, and the FTAAP proposals. Chinese interests have acquired a, glo a global character. The rest of emerging Asia is mainly an economic and cultural phenomenon, but uh, is also a part of an ongoing process. Taiwan, South Korea, and Singapore show that with the right interventions, 
developing countries can catch up with the advanced world. Emerging Asian countries are allergic to the view that outsiders should prescribe policy preferences for them. But they do not yet present a rival ideology to the Western world. Over time, they might offer an alternative discourse of modernity. For example, questioning the free market and democracy with a form of Sino-style Sino semi-free market model with an aut authoritarian framework. But there is little conformity or parallel timelines across these concerned countries. The Asians are busy stressing their differences rather than their commonalities, especially in South Asia. Even big and ancient Asian civilizations like Japan, India, and China do not seek to make other countries like themselves and have not articulated any worldview apart from the five principles of peaceful coexistence and Xi Jinping's four principles of major power relations, which are too vague to build upon and which relate to unspecified core interests. Meanwhile, the Asian part of the Asia-Pacific remains the home of every conceivable instability. With the largest concentration of population, big increases in the aspirational middle class, concerns over terrorism and the proliferation of nuclear weapons, interstate and intrastate tensions, abject poverty, and climate change fears, this region enjoys neither political nor economic unity, with systems of government ranging from communism to liberal democracy. There are unres unresolved territorial disputes. The Korean Peninsula is the most heavily armed region in the world. North Korea is a nuclear weapon state, and so are India and China. The strategic rebalancing exercise of the USA to the Asia Pacific, in whatever form it eventually takes, is regarded by China as unhealthy commitment. Yeah, sorry, containment. If there is any outbreak of warfare in Asia, the negative impact on the global economy would be completely immeasurable. A degree of Asian economic integration has evolved over the past decades. And intra-Asian trade has exceeded NAFTA and will soon exceed the EU. But political cooperation, as Mr. Pulika Paka mentioned, remains fragmented. The political map, in other words, is not the same as the economic map. And Asian integ integration will depend on the relations between China, Japan, and India, the big three on which any new Asian architecture would have to be based. These three have a special role to lead, but are too domestically preoccupied and have too little say in global institutions. In other words, they may, may not be a single Asian way, given the cultural and political differences between these three. And different Asians have different expectations of any future Asian community. Depending, uh, despite the disputes, emerging Asian economies are likely to focus on economic growth without external adventures. India and China account for half the global economic growth with high savings and investment rates. Although Indians, the Indian economy is too closed to incorporate with the deep integration free trade areas of Asia. China keeps interest rates low in the West, even as it makes the difficult transition from manufacturing to services, high investment to higher consumption, and state-driven decisions to free market determination. Despite foreign exchange reserves of $7 trillion, emerging Asia is unusually dependent on consistent growth to address its inequalities, mitigate environmental degradation, compete for finite natural resources, and ensure food security. In other words, the economic boom is essential for the authority of the Communist Party of China and increasingly important for re-election in democratic countries like India. 
Asian cooperation, as seen in the ASEAN Regional Forum, ARF, uh, ASEAN itself, or SARC, is in the spirit of Asian norms, namely the absence of confrontation, conscious use of reserve and restraint, respect for consensus-based solutions, reluctance to afford blame or force any partner to lose face, non-intrusiveness, soft institutionalization, and priority for harmonious conduct. In other words, good platforms for economic cooperation, but falling well short of robust political engagement. Rhetoric about win-win cooperation and attempts to craft a common narrative have not yet provided the commonalities needed for these countries to construct the appropriate architecture for political cohesion or to settle disputes. And this was correctly mentioned by Mr. Pulipaka also. Yet it is expected that Asian political weight, when not matched against one another or, or in its own neighborhood, such as China, Japan, India, Pakistan, will continue to expand as will the Asian sensitivity to Western criticism regarding pollution, the social mobility, freedom of expression, and human rights. China is by far the most prominent emerging power, but the rest of the world is also conscious of its drawbacks in regard to population, pollution, gender imbalance, internal unrest, uneasy relations with neighbors, and inadequate material resources. Chinese territorial and maritime claims are latent flashpoints, though the latter have not been adequately studied in other countries as to their origins and legitimacy. China's ambitions as a rising state can clash with those of the other main Asia-Pacific power, the United States. Competition for global resources and political and military tensions generate causes of concern. Such struggles, some historians tell us, have always accompanied the rise of new powers. The age of US primacy in Asia as the non-resident power is coming to a close, but China cannot displace America completely, and therein lies the danger, since the USA has decided to reassert its influence in Asia. Yet to my mind, it is difficult to find evidence of any real pivot to Asia Due to budgetary and several other limitations, the central component might comprise the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which has been limping towards the finishing line. Negotiations took more than six years, with the additional complications arising with Japan entering the talks, and there may not be political support for the TPP in the US Congress, or indeed in some other legislatures. Economic interdependence fosters greater cooperation, and the benefits of deeper integration are too strong for the parties to resist. The American allies in Asia, Japan, South Korea, Philippines, Taiwan, Singapore, and supporters like Vietnam and Thailand have much stronger economic ties with China than with USA. Political cooperation will grow on the back of increasing intra-regional economic flows. And here we must note the remarkable initiatives to address re decades of hostility and mistrust in the recent meetings between the leaders of China, Japan, and South Korea, between China and Taiwan, and I was going to say the visit of South Korean Ban Ki-moon to North Korea. But as you know that in the last few hour, few, few days, uh, that visit has been aborted, very strangely, considering that the reports came from North Korea, South Korea, and Chiwa, China in the first instance. However, we've got new reports of uh, a renewed dialogue between Seoul and Pyongyang, which is very encouraging. Now that courtesy the USA, now that courtesy the USA, India has become an honorary member of the Asia-Pacific, where does it stand in this scenario? India had, had no involvement in the unfolding tensions in the Asia-Pacific. The China-Japan 
and the Korea-Japan strife-strewn history, the island's disputes, Korean reunification, or the Taiwan Strait. There can be no question that China is the flying goose that has given the upthrust to economies all over the Asia-Pacific. But India is not without its assets. It is belittled by its incessant quarrel with Pakistan. But its disorderly democracy, although we despair of it in India, is admired by all countries attempting to move in a democratic direction, like Burma and Nepal. India is advantageously placed, despite its low income status, because no big power can afford to ignore India. Its rise is considered benign, and its future full of promise. We should maintain our friendly relations with major power centers, but avoid too close an identity with the American strategic agenda, which is fickle. We should actively pursue normalization of relations with China, including by educating our public. It is amazing to know that in no country in the world is China regarded with greater ignorance and hostility than India. And uh, the result is that we wrongly see ch every Chinese activity in South Asia as being Indocentric. We shall garner no international support in any conflict with China or Pakistan. This calls for faster movement towards determining the line of control with China and fresh thinking on Pakistan, which has become the indispensable nation to Afghanistan, China, the USA, and many countries in the Arab Peninsula. We cannot expect third countries to pull our chestnuts out of the fire. As TN9 has said in his remarkable recent book, economic growth is India's best foreign policy. We should forget about South Asia or the Indian Ocean being an exclusive sphere of Indian influence, but concentrate our minds on the legitimate security interests of India and encourage partners to be stakeholders in our economic growth. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attention.